So, uh, good afternoon or good morning, everybody. My name is GP. I'm the principal at Stack Armor. Uh, I hope folks are joining in for this uh, webinar and uh, thank you so much for participating. Uh, we will get started momentarily. Uh, good morning or good afternoon to you, uh, depending on the time zone that you're in. Thank you for again uh, logging into this uh, session on uh, FedRAMP and authority to operate for organizations that are interested in doing business uh, with the federal government. So we will go and get started momentarily. And again, uh, welcome and thank you for joining. So I think I've received the cue from our webinar coordinator to start. So again, uh, I am GP. I'm the principal here at Stack Armor. Uh, we are a AWS partner focused on delivering FedRAMP, FISMA, and DFARS compliance solutions for customers. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce a fantastic panel uh, and uh, give you an opportunity to interact with some incredible experts uh, in cloud security, uh, the government cloud market, as well as uh, from the voice of a customer perspective, uh, an incredible case study uh, from one of our customers, Somnoware, uh, who will be talking about their FedRAMP journey. So again, uh, welcome. And uh, we will be basically walking you through a story around uh, how you might go in and pursue a FedRAMP ATO. We'll talk a little bit about what an ATO is. And uh, again, for those of you that are a software company or providing incredible SaaS solutions are perhaps uh, in the Bay Area or in Austin, Texas or anywhere else uh, in the country that are delivering awesome cloud-based services and are now interested in doing business with the federal government, uh, there is a wonderful opportunity to do so. And so we'll really walk you through what some of your security and compliance obligations might be um, as you pursue that um, opportunity. So again, just to give you an overview of our distinguished panel and what we'll be talking about today for the next 60 minutes, uh, I have with me uh, Tom Suter, who is uh, a good friend, as well as obviously a very, very well uh, distinguished person in the federal government IT space. Uh, he is the principal of an organization called ATARC. Uh, they are a nonprofit that brings together government, academia, and industry to help drive trends and help the government uh, find innovation and connect new innovative solutions with the government marketplace. So he will be providing his points of view around cloud, um, some of the COVID related uh, developments, as well as his old overall perspective on the cloud market in government. Uh, we also have Stelio from Zscaler. He is a senior business executive uh, with Zscaler, as well as formerly with Amazon Web Services. Uh, his company Zscaler went through a successful, very successful ATO last year. And they actually have a solution that makes it easier to go in and obtain an ATO or an authority to operate for FedRAM compliance. We've had the privilege of working with Zscaler and actually deploying a solution in, uh, for one of our customers. And finally, not the least, we have Vinod Sundarajan, who is the chief technology officer of Somnoware, who is uh, an incredible a uh, healthcare solutions provider based in the Bay Area that recently went through the FedRAMP ATO journey, and we are privileged to have them here on this panel. So pretty interesting session, a diverse uh, set of uh, 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 speakers, and uh, we will sort of kick off the presentation uh, by giving you an overview of essentially uh, what is an ATO, uh, what is FedRAMP, uh, why is it important to you? And really sort of talk a little bit about some solutions or to some common problems that you might face 
um, as an organization that's looking to do business with the federal government related to a cloud solution. So just a quick introduction to Stack Armor. Uh, we are based in Washington, DC. Uh, I've had the privilege of doing cloud-based migrations and uh, compliance work for federal agencies for the last 10 years. Uh, I actually did my first cloud migration exactly 10 years ago on the 26th of April, 2010. So I'm up to my 10 year anniversary for a system called recovery.gov almost 10 years ago. Um, and again, we specialize in FedRAMP, FISMA, uh, and DFARS compliance for organizations engaging within the federal uh, marketplace. Uh, we are an AWS partner, very strongly invested in that relationship. Um, and again, we, we help customers maximize their ability to achieve compliance on the AWS uh, cloud service. Uh, in terms of our customer base, we have a wide portfolio of customers, uh, again, in the commercial government as well as public sector space. Uh, a wide portfolio of our customers need FedRAMP compliance, uh, FISMA compliance, the ability to host government data, be it through a grant uh, or a contract award. So again, we are privileged to be able to go in and help our customers be successful in uh, doing business with the federal government as far as cloud systems are concerned. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the big uh, name that we keep using in part of this conversation which is FedRAMP and ATOs. And normally the story is if you're within a hundred miles of the Beltway, uh, you know that uh, 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 at the back of your tongue and you never worry about explaining what it is. But you know, for those of you that have tuned in from all across the country, uh, really FedRAMP is a security and compliance program that is, has been established by the federal government to allow commercial cloud service providers to essentially provide their solutions into the federal government marketplace. And so why do you care? Uh, why is FedRAMP important? And so really, if you look at the, some of the recent numbers in terms of the, the size of the cloud market alone, as far as federal agencies is concerned, uh, Dell Tech published a report last year, uh, and it talks about the federal cloud computing market itself being a $9.1 billion market. Uh, the federal government spends approximately $90 billion a year in IT. So as you can see, uh, there's now a shift as it is happening generally to cloud-based solutions. And so again, uh, federal agencies are looking for innovation. They're looking for secure ways of hosting their data, uh, delivering you know, incredible uh, services in the healthcare space, financial space, uh, mission support, all kinds of things that the government needs help with. And again, so if you're a innovative company or a software provider, an ISV uh, that has some compelling solutions and you want to bring it to the government, then you want to take a look at uh, the FedRAMP uh, accreditation or certification programs that will allow you to go in and make sure that your cloud services are compliant with federal requirements. Uh, since again, we have done this for a fairly long time, uh, we hear uh, there is a lot of um, uh, sort of uh, perceptions, uh, I think mistaken perceptions, but the top three complaints that we hear uh, about pursuing compliance is, oh, it takes too long. Uh, you know, there are horror stories where, you know, people say it has taken them 12, 18, 24 months, obviously for a business that's a challenge. Uh, you want to be able to get through this process quickly. You want to be able to, you know, reap the benefits of delivering your solution to the government. So, uh, you know, time is clearly a problem. Uh, the second piece we hear a lot about is, oh, it costs too much. Oh, we've heard these stories that compliance costs one or two million dollars and things like that. And so um, there are some reasons why that might happen. So that's what we'll dig into today. And again, based on our experience, uh, we think that those numbers are outliers, not the norm. And of course, there is a fair amount of business risk pursuing this path. I mean, organizations, uh, you know, companies, SaaS companies, startups have investors, a board, uh, VCs. And so they want to make sure that the outcome of a FedRAMP uh, compliance investment 
uh, has minimal risk. And so these are some of the top three challenges that we see. And so if we dig into this a little bit, um, we understand this, we've done this for a long time. And so we just feel that these costs and timelines, a lot of times are associated with not making the right decisions up front. And so if a lot of times you sort of are not well informed or are not well educated about your different options and how you're going to go about this, it may cost you a bit more than it should have. Or it might take you a little longer because you went down a path that you shouldn't have in the first place. And so these are just some very common questions that we help answer for our customers up front. You know, a big one is, uh, and again, my friend uh, Vinod uh, from Somnaware can answer uh, some of these questions in his session and give you sort of firsthand experience on how uh, we help them sort of make some of these choices. Um, and then they, of course, made the decision to pursue a path that was ideal for them. But should I host in East West or should I host in GovCloud? You know, there are a lot of uh, myths about, oh, if I do business with the government, then I have to be in GovCloud. Uh, and you know, the reality of it is uh, that's not true. Uh, should I go for FedRAMP moderate? Or hey, my customer called me and I talked to somebody and they said, um, I have to uh, be a, a FedRAMP high. Well, all of those questions have cost and time implications. And so you wanna make sure that you make the right decisions up front, And that's the key part of the value that we provide to our customers is making sure that these questions are addressed up front so that you can make the right decisions, make the right investments, and therefore have the right expectations with regard to timelines. And so we, in, uh, in partnership with Amazon, are part of a specific program called ATO on AWS. Uh, ATO stands for Authority to Operate. And so again, we have taken all of these disparate pieces and distilled it down to a ATO acceleration solution that bundles all of these disparate aspects into a single service that is end-to-end -end and helps customers or cloud service providers uh, tackle these questions from a business standpoint, from a technical architecture standpoint, as well as from a compliance documentation standpoint to make sure that they're able to go in and cross this uh, sort of uh, 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 hurdle in achieving the compliant end state. And so we call it threat alert. And again, and we'll talk to you a little bit about it, but again, the key thing is uh, there is a solution at hand and it doesn't have to take as long or cost as much. So the first thing that we do is we provide a technical blueprint. Uh, we strongly believe that the Amazon cloud service offers by far the most comprehensive set of uh, architectural blueprints, best practices, as well as FedRAMP accredited services that we are able to package for our customers through uh, basically a landing zone and security architecture that's already pre-vetted, uh, pre-validated through Amazon as well as the security teams to make sure that we're able to get through the compliance uh, pathway pretty quickly. Um, so the first step again, like I said, is we go in and deliver an architectural blueprint that's optimized for compliance that goes in and delivers the end state that we are interested in. Uh, again, it's based on the landing zone architecture. We provide those key security services integrated as part of that so that you don't have to spend time engineering for it. So some of the services that we provide along with it are approximately 17 key services that directly map to NIST security controls. And so a lot of times the time and cost for going through an accreditation is spent on trying to figure this out, right? So um, by removing the guesswork, we've already selected the tools, we've got all of the technology in place so that now we can go in and accelerate the process of getting um, FedRAM compliant. So obviously in the compliance business, we have to talk about security controls. And so those of you that are auditors or are CISSPs and have gone through this and perhaps uh, different uh, 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 security requirements like HIPAA or SOC 2, you're very familiar with this. So the key thing is from a federal moderate baseline perspective, there are about 325 controls that have to be met. And so we have done some of the engineering and hard work up front 
where we are roughly able to go in and deliver more than 50% of those controls uh, right off the bat. Uh, so again, the whole idea is to accelerate your journey through automation, through standardization, and just being able to get you through that learning curve a little bit faster than you might otherwise. So the next slide sort of walks you through a real quick view of the benefits of using a FedRAMP accredited infrastructure as a service, such as provided by AWS. Um, and so this uh, controls matrix is essentially a color-coded chart of showing you that uh, how do we go in and sort of assert that we can help you get through the process faster and so for those of you that are sort of uh, you know, engineering oriented or compliance oriented, this is a workbook that shows all of the FedRAM 325 controls um, and how we treat them and how we are able to get you through the process faster. So for example, the ones quoted in purple in the middle, there are three control families, uh, roughly 40, 41 controls. Uh, you are able to get them off the bat by using AWS as an example. There are other controls that you are responsible for, there are in blue, uh, and there are controls that we provide out of the box on top of AWS. So again, this kind of a method uh, provides a very, very systematic engineering-based approach to helping you get through the compliance process. Of course, uh, you know, we have the technology, we have the controls. Uh, how do you now orchestrate an ATO? Obviously, there are lots of moving parts, uh, you have your engineering team, you have your ops team, you have uh, perhaps uh, a security team, you might have external consultants, uh, you have a third party assessor, you have your federal customer. How do you bring all of this together? And so that's where my colleague, again, Vinod, um, has done an incredible job in orchestrating, um, in my mind, uh, a, a light speed ATO, as I would call it. Uh, but again, uh, we strongly believe that success comes through systems engineering and again, orchestrating specific processes in a very, very agile way. And so again, we've built a run book that consists of six key sprints. Um, every sprint runs for two to three weeks. And so we believe um, we can get you uh, through uh, an ATO in a three to six, uh, into an ATO ready state in a three to six month timeline which is again, very, very focused from an engineering standpoint. Since we have the key components um, that are already sort of what I call prefab, we know what we're building, we know what we're deploying, you know exactly what the architecture looks like, and they are, we are able to very quickly go in and um, orchestrate that. So again, the Agile ATO process brings everything together and allows us to execute to deliver to the outcome. So we've had the privilege of uh, having tremendous amount of success in helping customers successfully achieve um, FedRAMP, FISMA, as well as CMMC, or, you know, or I should say to be the pre precursor of CMMC, um, NIST SP 800-171 compliance. And so we again, just see that this model works uh, across the board. So I just wanted to give you a flavor of what we do. And again, thank you for being on this broadcast. Uh, we do have a special offer for organizations that are interested in leveraging AWS. And so again, my colleague uh, Vinod here is a classic uh, case in point, and they'll talk a little bit about how they adopted AWS and sort of their journey. But again, it's a special offer to help uh, organizations uh, meet sort of some of the initial thresholds. And actually this program is funded in partnership with AWS. So if you are a qualified um, CSP or a SaaS company, then definitely get in touch with us and we'll find a way to go in and accelerate your process and also provide some funding support to go and do some of this initial assessment. So with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, uh, Vinod. Uh, Vinod is uh, an extremely experienced uh, technology executive. Um, he is the chief technology officer at Somnaware. Uh, we had the privilege of uh, interacting with him and his team uh, in October of last year. And I would like him to share his perspective on how they achieved a successful outcome for the incredible software that they built. Um, at this point, I'd like to invite Vinod to come in and share his journey and talk to you a little bit about Somnaware's success uh, with the FedRAMP ATO process. Vinod, over to you. Thank you, thank you, GP. Thank you so much for setting it up so well. 
So hello everybody, good morning, good afternoon. So hopefully in the next 10 minutes, I would like to uh, give a brief summary of how we were able to accelerate our journey towards a temporary ITO. And that falls in the category that, uh, uh, that, that GP alluded to called the agency sponsored ATO. So GP, if you can just skip to the next slide. So as Somnoware is in the space of healthcare and healthcare being huge, let me just give a few statistics. So uh, about uh, this field. So if you enter a hospital, there are over each medium sized hospital probably has about 10 to 12 devices, depending on the specialization. The challenge with the hospital systems is they are not they're not geared towards interoperability, which means each device does not talk to the other device. So 90% of the hospitals use six or more devices. Only one third of them actually integrate the devices so that the data gathered in one is passed on to the other. And even in those that integrate, less than three types of devices are tied together. What that means is of the six to 12 devices, types of devices that they use, just three are uh, usually tied together, talk to each other, but the other nine uh, are, are just uh, left standalone. So there's a lot of cost being lost in this industry. And what we do as some, what we as Somnumer do is focused in the sleep and COPD, which is pulmonary space. We try to connect the various devices. We are known for integrating over 40 devices, pulling it out together through a streamlined workflow and helping our users, which is the hospital systems and the users inside the hospital system, that's physicians, technicians, lab managers, administration, and so forth and so on, become efficient, avoid errors, and uh, deliver quicker, faster, better service. If you can move to the next slide, GP. So, so interoperability is the challenge, and we address it with, uh, as any other company does, uh, we address it with a bunch of API communication between devices where available. There's a lot of data interfaces, which is, which is very prevalent as long as it's available and opened up with the EHR, which is health record companies, medical record companies. And then all of that is there is a standard called HL7, much like the EDI of the supply chain. So tying it all together through the HL7 interface. So, so as we got into, as, as, as Somnoware is known for bringing together various systems, both in the capturing of device data and processing, enabling workflow efficiencies, and ultimately making sure the data reaches the right EHR, health record systems, at the right time. So that is where uh, the federal government Veterans Affairs, to be specific, was interested in our solution. And uh, we've been talking to them for a while now. But finally, I think most of the companies that are in this stage, we are a, we consider ourselves a mid-stage, small company. Uh, we, we have a very specific niche product. So for those of you who are in this space, you might be apprehensive whether it is a good time to take a leap with the federal government uh, is it going to, are you going to burn your fingers? So we had the similar doubts uh, uh, six months ago, October, same time. We had similar doubts. Are we big enough to take it on? Are we too small to burn a lot of cash? So same questions that Gaurav highlighted. What about the time? What about the money? Are we taking a big risk? Could it, what if this whole investment goes bust? Uh, so those are the same questions that we had. And, uh, and every time the answer came down to one thing, and I think hopefully that will help you too, if you are in the same boat as a service provider, cloud service provider, it all comes down to your confidence on your solution. Are you confident that your solution meets the needs of the specific agency uh, that you're talking to? That's, that's all it comes down to. If you think your solution serves the need, you will most probably see the reciprocation from the agency also, and that will give you the necessary confidence to proceed. So in this case, uh, we have been talking to VA for the last few years, but we never jumped in so far. But at this point of time, 
we as a team leadership team felt very confident that we have the right solution we have been talking to all the users in va the users are very confident that we have the right solution so so we just decided to take the plunge if you move to the next slide gp so i talked about all of this the key terms are patient workflow view of the patient the demographics data questions questionnaire as we do and then a lot of study types and all the data related to studies we have insights on based on certain data points diagnostic data points we are able to predict what who is a likely candidate for what level of sleep apnea or copd and we engage with the patient on various email text and other alerts and finally we have some rules engines to determine when to reach out to the patient and when not to so that's just a quick uh, quick snapshot of what we do moving on to the next one the reason i'm rushing towards this is this is probably where you're all very interested so our journey towards eto effectively began in october when we decided we will take the plunge that's when we brought stack armor in to help us with two different things one is to help us understand what this whole thing is about although we were working with va uh, we really didn't know the uh, we really didn't know the depth of this of this engagement so that's where um, starting with are we a moderate are we a high are we a low starting with should we go for a jab or agency sponsored in our case the agency sponsored was very obvious should you, uh, what are the controls so 6 months ago i had zero knowledge about pedram and thanks to stack armor they they came in they educated us quickly on that one slide which was very useful on the 320 uh, controls and 18 control families so in a way because we had some good software development practices we were able to understand and appreciate exactly what those families meant and what uh, what was being looked for and so so october is when we got in touch with stack armor we brought in a uh, third party um uh, authorization agent who was going to evaluate us and then by within a couple of months uh, we we went exactly with the same recommendations with stack armor gave us east coast versus gov cloud we debated that very quickly came to a conclusion uh, that our products are very amenable to the east coast and it was a no brainer because uh, because stack armor brought in the aws um, a box accreditation boundary so it was very easy for us to lift and shift so we had three boxes in the architecture flow one of the boxes pertained to somnoware products one of the boxes pertained to stack armor tools and technologies and the way it was architected by stack armor was also enabling us to bring on more agencies in separate instances in the future that allowed us to go and expand in the future so that was when our dr setup continuous monitoring which is a threat alert mechanism all that was ready to uh, ready to start engaging with the agency and 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 believe 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 me when i say every agency has at least 7 to 10 uh, groups of individuals who will be involved so that was a little daunting for us we didn't know whom to who is doing what we were a small company in that sense Uh, whereas we were talking to different uh, uh, different divisions departments uh, one day we would be told hey you have to talk to the um, to the med 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 team we didn't know who that team was so we would quickly research what that team would do and then go and and go and prepare for most of the documentation that that we had prepared was workable with every team so going to the next slide so by march 2020 we got our temporary ato ato which was authorization to operate and uh, now we are working towards the full ato and full ato which is sponsored by va and later on we can even take it to other federal government departments moving to the next slide so how did we what did we uh, do differently i'm probably nearing my 10 minute level so first and foremost i think uh, as a small company you need a executive champion who is relentless fearless and we have our ceo led this from the front and he was the conduit for all interdepartment discussions with fedram with 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 all the departments within within the federal agency 
So that was a big uh, must have. Uh, you need to know where you stand because you will be facing various departments and you need to know how you're going to navigate through. Who is your key sponsors? For us, we had a set of key within the sponsor sponsoring agency. We had key evangelists, champions who would stand by us. So you need to identify who they are and how to navigate. And that, uh, the champion, executive champion is the person who's going to do all that. From the next step is all about security. So your application is probably going to have its own internal security aspects, vulnerabilities and all that. So which we got lucky with because we are already doing SOC 2s and high trust. We are doing that for a number of years. So that part was easy. But the part that we faced challenge was the multiple tools, uh, third party libraries, tools, APIs that we call outside, APIs that call us. So we had to do a lot of uh, reaching out to these vendors to make sure we gathered their security documentation so that we could add it to the controls. So it was not enough if you document your application, you have to uh, call out all your touch points, who's going to call you, who are you going to call in terms of APIs, and you need to make sure you have a very strong collection of documents from them about their strength, their vulnerabilities, what they do. So that's probably something you need to get a head start on. The third person, IT architect is again incredibly important. This is the person who works directly day, to, day in, day out with a company like Stack Armor, working with their team, setting up, um, set, uh, working with them on their threat alert setup, the accreditation boundary, setting up this, your applications on the cloud, making sure they're talking together, and, and uh, instrumenting all the Splunks, all the tools that you need, like logging and, and gathering information. And we have, uh, Zscaler is going to talk about the tools available, which makes it fast. So that's the IT architect, completely in, the, in, this, in, this, in the problem area. And to support these three people, you need an internal team, it, it could be a bunch of engineers. It could be a, a, a couple of uh, IT folks who will, be, uh, who will be shadowing your security architect and IT architect and just doing whatever it takes. Uh, and that, so that's very important. And that's a war. It's a, it's a war zone. Whatever is identified, you have to make it happen in 24 hours. That's all that it takes. There will be uh, one document, which is the SSP, is very critical. Uh, everything is based on that. And it's about, it starts off as the template itself starts off at about 300 pages. And the overall document can run into multiple thousands of pages. And that you can achieve only with this team, team of people. And uh, last but not the least, you need to partner with a company like Stack Armor, Stack Armor, who was recommended to us by AWS directly. And in every step of the way, uh, either by virtue of continuous monitoring tools or, or technologies or selection or decision making, we just didn't, the, the Stack Armor team would, would explain to us what a particular terminology would mean, what the pitfalls are if we go one way or the other, and the more or less that helps us make the decision. Going to the next slide, GP. So again, uh, uh, the two things that we uh, worked with Stack Armor closely are on the threat alert um, platform, which made our lives so much easy. We didn't even think about what tools, what technologies, how do you manage this, how do you monitor this. All that was more of a, a connect, plug and play. We we dropped our applications in a in a in a in a VP virtual area, private area, and then uh, uh, the tools plugged into our applications and worked seamlessly. And on the consultation side, knowledge side, again, amazing help. So, so that was the last slide from our side. And if you have any questions, I would, um, we can do it in the Q&A session. Thank you. That brings to an end of my time. Great. Thank you so much for this. Um, you know, we know this is uh, incredible. And again, you know, first of all, uh, congratulations to you and your team. And you know, definitely a lot of lessons for folks that are in similar positions to yourself. And quite honestly, you know, it's very important for people to see success stories like yours. 
so that they are not disheartened by you know what uh, what they otherwise might see or hear. So it's incredible, uh, and thank you again for taking the time to you know be part of this session. So uh, and yes, you're absolutely right. You have a fearless leader. Um, I have had the privilege of interacting with the Somnoware CEO, and um, I, I promised him that uh, I think his his ATO would be the he would break break the word speed record on ATOs. <laughs> Yes. And so uh, hats off to you guys, an incredible team and an incredible company. And thank you again for being here. So with that said, um, I have got an incredible set of uh, panelists, uh, uh, people like Tom Suter and Stelio, who have been uh, patiently listening into this conversation. And I think there is a lot more for us to share with you. Um, for those of you that are tuned in and obviously are familiar with uh, web screen shares, uh, please do send in your questions and we will make sure that we read out your questions and, and address them to the panel to make sure that you're able to get the maximum value from your participation in this session. So with that, I would like to introduce uh, my fellow panelists and move it into the next stage of this presentation um, and talk a little bit about uh, FedRAMP, ATO, the government cloud space innovation. And uh, in my mind, you know, Tom is definitely plugged into that. Uh, I would like him to perhaps um, introduce himself to the audience and maybe just uh, get things kicked off. And so Tom, we would love to have your introduction. Thanks, GP. Um, yes, I'm looking back on my picture. I made a committed effort at the beginning of this, um, at the beginning of this pandemic, I was gonna shave my head. So I, I, I lost some of my hair. It's actually growing back right now. Uh, thanks for having me. And I was, GP, when you started this thing off, I remember your work on the rat board. That's what actually when I met you. And I remember that was like pretty much the first AWS implementation. And it basically uh, looked at all the projects that were going on at up, up to a trillion dollars we spent. And you were tracking all the, all the spending in real time. And it was just an amazing project. It would be an amazing project today. You did that, you know, back when cloud you know everybody cloud was just getting started aws had eight people working for them you know in government uh, it was just in the very beginning of this so uh, thank you for your early leadership there uh, just some couple of notes i was looking at the cloud market i, I think that uh, the data center market um, is 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 bigger than that than bigger than the cloud market that you showed i i believe it to be much bigger and there are kind of estimates, maybe maybe about six months ago, um, I was talking to an executive from Microsoft, and they think that the cloud has addressed 10% of the possible market. So we're, you know, we're going toward cloud. And I think another issue that everybody in the government space should be aware of, and we've been talking about it now for about a year and a half, is the concept of IT modernization. I've got all these legacy systems. How many times have we heard this? I've got these monolithic legacy systems that are you know, developed in COBOL and, uh, you know, 40 years ago. Well, it was kind of a lot of talk, I would say, even though I have an IT modernization summit, I think it's, um, the rubber has definitely hit the road is we've had to uh, look at some of these systems and have to adapt on the fly. And frankly, it's been a disaster. I think it's been a disaster on the commercial side. We've seen some of that. Uh, we've seen uh, companies trying to get their payroll done, and some of these banks cannot respond to even accepted application. Um, that affects people's lives. Uh, we've seen it in government. Uh, uh, these legacy systems aren't meant to be adaptable. So I think cloud plays a very, very important, important role in that. I think one of the things in Washington, D.C. that bothers me um, is I've seen this on the culture side is we're very peoply here. We like to have lots of people involved. Uh, automation's kind of a dirty word. Uh, we had this industrial complex here where we have uh, vendors uh, that primarily provide bodies for support. And sometimes their definition of success might be, well, I've got 10 bodies on, on a project. If I can get to 12 or 13, that, that's how I increase revenue. They're not looking at the overall concept of value and um, I think that this is one of those things that GP is really addressing with Stack Armor is providing you value. So you get this expertise and then you're combining it with automation. 
uh, a lot of a lot of uh, contractors in this town don't like automation. As a matter of fact, they shield government customers from automation because they fear that it's going to cost them revenue, and they're basically putting the revenue on how many hours I'm going to bill. They want you to look at a bill. Well, I'm a little more competitive than my competitor because I'm three dollars an hour cheaper. I think they're looking at it the wrong way. They're playing the game the wrong way. So uh, I think that this, uh, uh, you know, ATO process, that um, automatic ATO process of GP is very revolutionary. Um, I can talk a lot about a lot of things, but one thing that I will say is, is part of ATARC, we've looked at a lot of companies out of Silicon Valley entering the market. And uh, you're going to make this investment into federal and it's a sizable barrier for entry. You've got to, you know, get your Fed ramp. You've got to have kind of some kind of story there. But even hiring your sales team, you want to maximize that. So I look at it as you've got a bucket of federal investment. I've seen a lot of efforts fail because they're investing so much. Even if they go down the Fed ramp and they pay a lot of money and they they go down this whole road, uh, it's sacrificing potential salespeople that you know marketing and sales dollars because they're spending so much money on getting certified. So, and I think that time to market is very, very important that GP was talking about. If it takes too long to get to market, I've seen so many times the first sales team never makes it. They end up uh, having to not make it. And then uh, the vendor has to look at themselves and say, what am I doing in this federal market? Maybe they stay in, maybe they don't. But that poor first sales team, They've got, uh, they've got their work cut out for them when they're waiting for this ATO process and all the investment dollars that, that go into it. Um, I'll just leave it at there, and I want everybody else to have a chance to talk, but those are some of my observations initial. No, absolutely, Tom. Thank you so much for that. And you know, I think you touched on so many interesting points that hopefully are uh, sort of a way for you know, others to sort of provide new and disruptive solutions. You talked about IT modernization. And I think that's a great segue into uh, bringing Stelio and Zscaler into the conversation. I think um, I've had the privilege of uh, working with Zscaler all of 2019, uh, actually deploying their solution uh, for some of our customers. And again, the key part there was it had to be a FedRAMP accredited solution. So to me, Zscaler's presence on this broadcast is incredible from multiple different ways. Uh, one, uh, they are by far one of the most disruptive um, uh, elements around the way we handle networks, the way we handle network security, and quite honestly, what has been a big bottleneck to IT modernization, which is tick compliance and the cost associated with backhauling to cloud-based traffic through those networks. So I would love for Studio to sort of talk a little bit about, uh, of course, his, his background, uh, but then more incredibly, uh, their journey, of course, you know, they went through the ATO journey and they make a, made a big bet. Um, I think they had an incredibly successful FedRAM program. Uh, but then more importantly, how does he see sort of the, the government marketplace and some of the unique innovations they're driving? So, Stereo, over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, GP, and the, the very interesting uh, discussions from Vinod and Tom uh, definitely resonates. As you mentioned, the Zscaler is, um, is a, a disruptor in the market. We, too, have gone through that ATO journey. Um, some of the experiences that uh, Vinod alluded to uh, were, were uh, definitely resonate. You know, some of the lessons learned for us includes getting that early executive level buy-in, uh, understanding that there's going to be a financial and a resource commitment requirement to get through it all. And so over the past couple of years, we're starting with that CEO commitment and board level commitment. Uh, we brought on uh, the tech, the approach we took was to bring on a very experienced leader in government that provided that relentless, tenacious, uh, energy that Vinod uh, alluded to, it is uh, very important because it is a journey. So Stephen Kovac came on as VP of uh, Lines and Government and led us through that. We are now, so in the context of what you're getting to, alluding to with the um, IT modernization and where we play, uh, we do have uh, a number of FedRAMP ATO solutions. So Zscaler provides secure remote access 
for any user with any device over any network. And that includes uh, federal employees and contractors and so forth. Um, and so we've got a uh, FedRAMP moderate solution for internet access and a FedRAMP moderate solution for uh, private access to uh, data centers and, and public clouds such as AWS uh, and hybrid IT environments. And we are FedRAMP high in progress, so that's imminent that we'll have a FedRAMP high ATO as well. So that's three ATO journeys in about two years. Uh, and we're very excited about that, very proud of that. Um, what we're seeing, so, you know, the, the time of this webinar is really interesting, and thank you for having me on it. You know, what we've seen are two significant uh, unanticipated converging events recently, which you're aware of, but one is the um, CISA released recently, just uh, about a week ago, uh, an update to the TIC 3.0 specification, and that paves the way to faster cloud adoption. I'll talk a little bit about that and how that is relevant in, in the FedRAMP um, uh, domain. And also the CARES Act providing funding is uh, providing the funding and re removing some hurdles to the process, which is gonna make it uh, easier for federal agencies to acquire modern solutions. Those two combined really pave the way to uh, getting through the, the IT modern, accelerating the IT modernization uh, initiatives that they have that Tom alluded to. And, you know, when I think of the IT modernization initiatives, quite often what they, what they translate to are things like um, cloud transformation initiatives, and, and that will drive network security and application transformation initiatives. And, and where we come in are uh, supporting that with the, the network and security transformation. So, you know, what, uh, what we've seen and what I think a lot of organizations are, are seeing right now is that for most organizations, remote access is primarily centered around utilizing uh, legacy VPN or virtual private network to access application data. And historically they've been driven by um, now updated regulatory requirements that they have to comply with. And so the TIC 3.0 that you alluded to, uh, GP, is a uh, most recently, just again, a couple of weeks ago, the CISA released interim uh, guidance that uh, enables organizations to adopt more modern solutions. So uh, right now, things are being able to think about how you provision applications in the cloud and data in the cloud and access to those applications and data in the cloud are now Quite different than they were certainly six months ago, but I'd argue even a, a few weeks ago. And the problem is that uh, it doesn't help most agencies because essentially they're still tied to legacy architecture. And so, you know, what we've got here is a panel of, of innovators, basically, that you alluded to GP, and, and, and the time is great. You know, crisis is a double-edged sword. One of the positive aspects to the current situation is it's an accelerator to change. So there's a forcing function now for agencies to move forward. No, and, uh, yeah. yeah. Sirio, thank you so much for that. You know, as I was thinking about your comments, um, you know, one sort of thought flashed through my mind. It looks to me like, you know, right on this small panel, it looks like we have the entire government cloud ecosystem in a, mm -hmm. in a way. Uh, you know, you have uh, Zscaler, that is providing this, uh, I call it the last mile link, which is the ability for an agency to securely connect to the cloud, right? So you're, you're offering that TIC 3.0 solution and that has been an incredible problem uh, in the past. I've lived it uh, and you know, again, Tom I know has uh, lived it. And so you know, you're, you're solving the ability to go in and drive cloud consumption by providing what I call the on-ramp to cloud. Uh, we have people like Tom Suter, who I think is making a bold statement. I mean, he's, he's willing to challenge the status quo through ATAR and his leadership. Um, I think it's a very bold for him to come in and talk about, you know, um, vested interests and, you know, the old way of doing things. And he's constantly, I know I've known him for a long time, 10 years, as he said, and he's bringing the government and industry and academia together on finding new ways. So he's generating demand and awareness. Um, and then we have incredible success stories like Somnaware who are like, hey, you know, uh, yes, it is a little bit of a hurdle, 
but a startup, a mid-stage startup can do it and there are testaments. So I was just sort of reflecting on that. Um, so I'm very privileged to be part of this panel. And I guess, you know, in the context of this discussion a little bit, um, Vinod, you obviously are, um, you know, sort of, um, uh, I want to use the right phrase, but you're, you're, you're fresh off the ATO boat, let's say. <laughs> uh, you sort of uh, have done a significant investment, you're down this journey. And so how are you looking at sort of the federal marketplace? Are you saying that, hey guys, you know, we sort of uh, went into this journey, didn't know what we were getting into, but now we are learning more about, you know, the government and VA and, you know, you mentioned talking to different teams. Do you see now that Somnaware will invest more and more into the government space and, you know, perhaps uh, explore other FedRAM partners, you know, like Zscaler and Tom's organizations? How are you starting to think about the FedRAM or I should say the government marketplace, given your initial success? Yeah. So uh, I should admit, this is very early days for us. Six months in this, in this journey is not enough. I mean, I know Tom and Stelio and yourself, you all have actually shaped this thing. So uh, having said that, yes, we do see uh, that uh, hard as the uh, journey looks, uh, it is going to be all that much, uh, that much sweet when you achieve, uh, when you get past your ATO, because now you're suddenly uh, ready to go and, and, and more agencies are interested of the bat from a customer perspective. So it's, so the first hurdle is probably the hardest. And then to your second part of the question, definitely GP, uh, looking to expand more on the solution because uh, it, it, the way you all made it, Zscaler yourself have made it is, it made it easier, easier for us, companies like us who are pure play software vendors to jump into this space. So, so we definitely would like to expand, not only in our customer base, but also in the solutions that we provide to slightly uh, larger markets than we're just targeting right now. And, and the tools and technologies and, uh, and the practices will all help us, uh, uh, help us expand faster. That's awesome. Uh, one question for you, Tom, along those lines. So obviously, you know, I've seen you in action uh, you're driving, you know, you, you, you're, you're driving IT modernization, government modernization on, you know, a slew of topics. So I guess if you were to, you know, what is sort of going through your mind when you see obviously all the hurdles and, you know, all the challenges, but then you see success stories, uh, you know, like uh, Zscaler and you see success stories like Somnaware. I mean, Somnaware is a startup, they're in the Bay Area. They have solved this incredible problem for big hospitals and they're bringing that innovation to the VA. I mean, there's something patriotic to it almost, you know, in terms of doing something great and bringing that technology to the government. What do you sort of say to encourage that? And what do you see sort of uh, what we can do to help them uh, and create more such success stories? I think this is the webinar for me to say things that get me in trouble. Um, <laughs> I, I, I know from talking to security folks, especially and CIOs, they have a tendency not to want to be first. You know, you were lucky enough on the rat board to have Sean Kingsbury. They don't want to be second. They don't want to be last though. So they want to see some good success stories. And uh, if they can get these good success stories then they're going to follow, I think we need to get these good success stories out. We need to find these brave champions that are going to do the original initial innovation. And then, I think one, one thing ATARC is trying to do is we're not creating the stories. We're taking the stories that are already there and yeah. trying, to, trying to get them out. We always talk about, you know, we want to involve Silicon Valley. Well, you know, I think a good story with uh, Vinod is get that story out there, especially when he starts really getting in and doing these work. We need to reward these innovators and at the same time, um, you know, showing it can be done. Uh, you know, back to Zscaler, like right now they were talking about, Hey, we need to have remote commute, com, you know, computing better. And here we are. Now we have this going on. And uh, you know, most of the government, a lot of the government right now, from my understanding, they can't even use video. So, like what we're doing today, they can't even do because uh, the network congestion. Mm -hmm. They don't have, you know, the VPNs. I think we can get, probably do a poll right now with the government people on, on to see what we're doing. Um, you know, it's better to prepare for the coming challenge that you don't know what it is. And I know that for my private industry, you know, and I think that we keep learning these lessons the hard way. 
and we need to change that culture. Uh, I, I think I agree with you. I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I think uh, the, the, the work I think, uh, you know, Stelio and the Zscaler team is doing, I think is incredible. And I think it's uh, transformational and I think it can, you know, again, it's slow. So, you know, that there is a process involved and, uh, but the good news is everybody's down the track. So we do have some questions coming in from our wonderful audience. And, um, you know, I wanted to sort of throw out this question uh, for those of you uh, that are in sort of the DOD space. So this is coming from somebody who was interested from a DOD space. And the question is, um, any thoughts about uh, CMMC uh, compliance? And, you know, how do you see sort of the CMMC compliance space working out? And any correlation or reciprocity uh, with FedRAP? So I guess it's a broad question. Uh, I don't know, you know, Tom or Studio, if either of if you are brave enough to wade into that. Uh, uh, but uh, maybe uh, uh, Tom, if you want to take a first I, crack at it, I would say this. I think what we what do we learn from FedRAMP? We're we're in eight years into the program. Let's think about automatic ATO for that program. We're going to need that right out of the chute. Um, or else it's gonna be very expensive and very costly. I think there needs to be an automatic ATO strategy right out of the gate for that. Um, instead of, especially the early adopters, they take the brunt of the learning curve. I think we can take those lessons for FedRAMP and bring them over to CMMC. And fortunately, some of the people like a GSA are comparing notes to what FedRAMP is doing uh, in the DOD as well. Uh, let's not learn this again, the same lessons for this different program. Uh, Studio, what is your point of view on CMMC? Is that something area that you're obviously focused on and, you know, you have a capability that helps organizations get CMMC into a CMMC compliant end state faster or leverage your FedRAMP solution? Well, what I, you know, one of the things I want to call out was uh, one of the ways we do help uh, JP and, and you're familiar with this and what I'd recommend to those that are trying to get FedRAMP faster or help their customers uh, get a better experience would be to really leverage things like the ATO and AWS uh, program, that ecosystem, because in so doing, we all not only learn from each other, but we've got a collective set of uh, solutions that can help each other uh, achieve ATO faster, uh, maintain it, uh, because that's an ongoing process, and also deliver uh, those benefits to customers with added value, the way Stack Armor and Zscaler did uh, together. So in terms of um, you know, delivering value uh, in that regard, I, I think that's a key takeaway for those uh, on, on this uh, uh, podcast or video. I, I, no, I think that's an incredible perspective. And you know, just to add a flavor from, you know, from a Stack Armor standpoint, um, I absolutely agree. I think that you know the correlation between or the relationship between CMMC and FedRAMP is multifaceted. I, I agree with you. There are some incredible learning lessons and some of the solutions and accelerators that apply for the FedRAMP marketplace through the ATO and AWS program. Um, they apply for CMMC as well. It's a different program, different set of uh, additional security requirements, things like that but the basics don't change. I mean, you still need to worry about encryption. You still need to worry about multi-factor authentication. All of the basic uh, block and tackling still needs to occur. And so there is no need, as I think Tom, you alluded to, to relearn that curve uh, and drive up the cost for everybody. So I think CMMC is very yeah. well positioned to be able to take advantage of that. And you know, just from a Stack Armor standpoint, we have helped customers already sort of move down the track off eventually become CMMC compliant as and when that program matures. So I think great question. Um, I know this, uh, we could you know, keep talking for uh, a long time and you know, unfortunately I've enjoyed this session a lot, but uh, that also means that time has flown by faster than um, I would have liked. So in the interest of uh, just making sure that the audience gets the full value of from participation in this, um, maybe I'll just do a quick round robin and uh, uh, go, you know, maybe start with you, Vinod, first um, as uh, voice of the customer. Any final thoughts uh, that you might share based on the lessons that you've learned with somebody else who is trying to come in after you to basically explore, um, you know, an ATO or, you know, explore the government market? A any quick final comments? Yeah, I would just repeat what I said earlier. Just decide if you're going to jump in 
and that's the key decision point and the moment you decide you are go all out and the uh, partner with a company like uh, stack armor and others but go all out but decide first think twice and think thrice but then once you jump in never look back that's all i would say that's very well said you know stilio what about you you yeah thank you i'd like to reiterate that there is a, a growing community in the ecosystem uh, that can, from uh, which we can lean on each other so i'd uh, recommend that uh, anybody seeking solutions look at that ecosystem and look for uh, for partnership within it to deliver easier to consume higher value solutions Tom, um, the last but not the least, you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I would say take advantage of the lessons other people have learned. I know in our working groups, the GPs are part of that we discuss these issues. Um, you know, somebody's done it before you. Let's go learn from, from them. And that's one of the reasons why you're on the webinar anyway. But go learn from somebody else, and then maybe you can add some things that you're learning along the way. I think that's probably the, the best advice I can give. Great. Again, Tom, thank you for your participation. We love your uh, background and, you know, uh, love uh, your participation on the show. Uh, Stelio, again, the same. And Vinod, again, thank you for being a part of this podcast. Um, thank you also to the wonderful audience that tuned in. Uh, please do shoot us back your comments. If there were questions that we did not get time to answer, we'll make sure we send you those comments. And again, we, if there are some other topics that you'd like to see us cover or any one of our panelists, don't hesitate to let us know. And again, thank you to our panelists and we will stop this broadcast at this time. Thank you. Thank you.